Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us today, Pentecost Sunday. My name is Arla, and I serve in the Union Church Children's Ministry. Join the class at UCMU with the final study series on the Old Testament. Every Saturday, beginning May 29th. To register, please email the address on your screen. If you'd like to volunteer at QCM, or you're already one, join the class on June 5. Learn about the volunteer program and listen to an inspirational talk about the heart of a volunteer for the service of the Lord. Come and discover how to really help those who are dying or grieving. Learn practical tools to help you know what to say and do with Dr. Don Eisenhower, founder of Coaching at End of Life. Please save the date, June 12. What does it mean to be a kingdom woman in today's world? Find out at the Kingdom Women Fellowship, where women of all ages are invited to a time of inspirational biblical teaching and enriching discussions in the hope of deepening their faith. Come for the first time anytime. If you're a woman of UCM, join the fellowship. The Children's Ministry offers a weekly online Sunday school. Connect with the UCM Kids on Facebook to know more. The Youth Ministry invites students in grades 7 to 12 to join the online service and fellowship. For updates, like Disciples of Christ United on Facebook. To sign up for these opportunities for Christian growth, scan the respective QR codes. Registration details are available in the UCM Bulletin posted online. There are many ways to give or donate to the church. Please visit the website or refer to the Bulletin. If you need prayer support, please let us know by emailing ucmcares at unionchurch.ph. A prayer minister will reach out to you to pray with and for you. Thank you and God bless. Well, today is Pentecost, and for Christians, Pentecost is the day on which we commemorate the coming of the Holy Spirit on the earliest followers of Jesus. And we recognize and celebrate Pentecost Sunday here now seven weeks or about 50 days after the celebration of the resurrection on Easter Sunday. Let me share with you some more about Pentecost and this important day. Before the events of the first Pentecost, there were followers of Jesus Christ, but there was no movement that could be meaningfully called the church. From a historical point of view, Pentecost is the day on which the church of the New Testament that we now know, it is the day that the church began. This is also true from a spiritual point of view, since the Spirit brings the church's life into existence. The Spirit of God brings the church into existence and gives us life, life of His love and His power. So in a way, Pentecost today is the church's birthday. Pentecost presents us, the church, and as individual believers, in God, in Christ, it presents us with an opportunity once again to evaluate, to reflect, to consider how we are living each day. Are we relying on the love and power of God's Spirit? Are we open and attentive to His leading? Pentecost is an illustration of the truth that is found throughout Scripture that the community of God's people is central to God's work in the world. Pentecost invites us to consider our own participation in the fellowship and mission of the church. Pentecost invites us, God invites us by way of His Spirit to be renewed as an essential member of the body of Christ, and to be renewed in using our God-given gifts to strengthen the church in the transforming of hearts 
through Jesus Christ. I'm going to read for us now here in the scripture, in the book of Acts, the Pentecost, as we continue our worship of the one from which life and purpose first came. Here is the scripture. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your Spirit. We thank you that you give life through your Spirit. We thank you for the church. We thank you for the coming of the Holy Spirit that brings life and power to the church and enables the church by your giving of gifts to be strengthened in the transforming of hearts through Jesus Christ. We thank you for your great love, Lord. We thank you for your great power. My prayer today is that we would indeed be renewed as those first followers of Jesus were empowered, that we would be renewed with a, with a full realization of your power and your life in the church and in our individual lives, that you would help us recognize anew, afresh, your leading, your, um, your ministry happening in and through the church and through our individual lives, that you want to bring your love and your power to others through the church, through us, by your Holy Spirit. So we thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, so much for your gifts. We love you. We honor you. And do indeed overwhelm us with your presence today as we worship you and honor you and give thanks on this day of Pentecost. In Jesus' name, amen. What happened that day when the Spirit arrived, when the Holy Spirit came? What happened then? It got loud, loud enough to be heard all over town. Fire appeared, divided and dispersed to each of them. The outsiders came running and they heard the fire talkers tell of God's mighty works in their own language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretans, and Arabians. The Spirit had come to describe the glory of God in their native tongues through those who followed Christ. These representatives of the world stood astounded but curious, bewildered but ready. Then Peter showed them from the scripture exactly what it meant, revealing God's promise to all who trust in Jesus. And many believed, and many repented, and many were baptized, and many were saved. The Spirit had come. The church was born. Like a hurricane, I am a tree. Bend 
Holding beneath the weight of its wind in mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me Our scripture reading for today is Revelation chapter 4, verses 3 to 11. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. 
From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was as it were a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes, all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let us pray. Father God, as we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost virtually this Sunday, may we be reminded of your unconditional love and the sufferings and death that you have endured to save us. We pray in your name for those who are hungry and those who are hurting in any way. Grant them comfort and strength as they undergo different kinds of trials, especially during this time of crisis brought about by the pandemic. We also lift up to you, Lord, those who are sick and troubled. Give them the gift of healing and life. Father, may we also feel your presence as we go through our life's journey, that we may have peace, happiness, and contentment in our hearts. We lift up to you our beloved pastors, staffs, and volunteer workers working for your glory. Provide them the strength, faith, and the patience that they need in their ministry. We pray for our church and all the churches that spread your word, that more and more will know you and be saved. Remind us, Lord, that we are saved not by our actions, but by your grace alone. We love you, Lord. We praise you and we trust you. With all our love and gratitude, all these things we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let us affirm our faith by proclaiming the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're tuning in across this world um, and whatever time you're uh, tuning in. We are so delighted that you are here on Pentecost Sunday at Union Church of Manila to celebrate this time together as we remember in our liturgical calendar the birth of the church and uh, we celebrate that together. And and, and we trust that as, as we do that, that you would recall also the rich heritage that we have in the body of Christ that goes back for more than 2,000 years. And, and we've spent a little time celebrating that, but as we go our separate ways and as we go throughout the day, don't forget that this is an important day on our liturgical calendar where we give thanks to the Lord and remember the heritage of the church, the foundation of the church, and the rich legacy of the body of Christ from Pentecost Sunday all the way to the present. Secondly, I, I want to remind us that this is the final installment of our six-week series on Here I Stand, where we are looking at five different pillars that the reformers were looking at and calling the church back to back in the 1500s that are still very relevant today. And this last week, it's the uh, pillar of soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. And we'll look at that one. But next week, we're moving into a new study. It's a study on the life of David, particularly in the season of his life where he was going through some difficult times. So we're calling the series David's Desert exalting God during dark days. And David certainly had a a lot of dark days and he gives us some uh, insight as to how we can exalt God and how we can live for the purposes of God, not just for the purposes of ourselves, but we were created for his glory and, and how we can do that in the midst of challenging days, which I know we are in and we've been going through and we continue to press through. So we invite you to come back. That series will be several months long and we would love for you to be able to join us during that series starting next week. So let's go. If you have a Bible, if you have uh, something in front of you, a tablet, if you can download notes, I encourage you to put them out in front of you. Take notes, study along, follow along, turn the pages of your Bible to follow along. We'll be jumping around in various scriptures today, and we encourage you to follow in some way or another to help uh, instill some of the thoughts of today in the scripture into our mind. But before we do that, let's invite the Lord into our time together. Lord, to you alone be the glory today. And we pray that this message would point to your glory and remind us of your great glory and that we are created for your glory. Come share that glory with us during our time together. In your name, amen. Well, my daughter, she discovered me on the internet this week, uh, this last week. She came down the stairs and said, dad, you're on the internet. I said, well, okay, that's, that's, uh, isn't everything on the internet? But uh, let me explain sort of her thought process. At first, she, she wanted to see if she was on the internet. So she types in her name, Ellie Williams, and nothing significant, not relating to her, but at least points uh, comes up. And then she goes to her mother and then her brother. And she said, but I put your name in, Dad, and, and, and your picture came up on the first time I, I typed in your name. I thought, wow, uh, you, you know, there's certainly not a lot of Chad Williamses out there if my picture is coming up. Uh, on the first go round, but then she got really excited and she said, and guess what? I put in Pastor Chad Williams and all of us came up. I, uh, I went and I looked to see what she was talking about. A picture from us uh, at Union Church of Manila of my family comes up uh, when you type in Pastor Chad Williams, but her final words were after she said that, she said, dad, we're famous. I thought, well, in the mind of 11-year-old girl, I, I guess that's, you know you've arrived when you can type your name in the internet uh, or in Google and, and your picture comes up and, and there you are for all the world to see. I, I guess we've all been there at some point. We like to see our faces next to our names. We like to think of ourselves as being important. We like to exalt ourselves. We like to be recognized and idolized in the center of attention and have people looking at us and and feel as though we're important. All this quest for self-recognition and self-odulation is not something unique to us. It's it's not been something that has been uncommon in the church throughout the centuries. In fact, if you go to the time of Jesus, even in Jesus' day, he's dealing with the same issues. And he brings up three different scenarios in his Sermon on the Mount where he talks about somebody who is praying for self-odulation or self-recognition. And and Jesus says, if you're going to pray, make sure that you're doing it so that you don't bring glory to yourself. But so so go into the closet and do it privately. And then he talks about giving. And he says, if you're going to give, 
Make sure you're not doing it in a way that everybody is uh, seeing you and you're making lots of noise as you write the check saying, I am giving today 10 million pesos. Hey, not, nothing like that, but that you do it quietly. And then when you're fasting, make sure that nobody knows that you're fasting. You're not walking around as though weakened and, uh, and, and pale and, and so that you can display to everyone that you're fasting. He says, uh, the righteous deeds that we do are not for our own glory. And after all of this, he says to the, the people who are listening to him, he says, now, here's the thing. Let them see your good deeds that they might glorify your Father in heaven. He, he points us back to the fact that when we live this life, it is not about self-odulation. It's not about self-glorification. It is about pointing to the glory of God that he alone gets the glory. And even after Jesus' example, we see it uh, this self-odulation coming into play in the early church. In Acts chapter 8, the apostles are preaching the gospel and they're doing some pretty marvelous things. And there is a man by the name of Simon. He becomes known as Simon Magus or Simon the Magician in church history. And Simon, he was somebody who, who wanted to be honored that was someone who was great. He thought he was someone great and he wanted to be recognized as someone who was great. And so he goes to the, the apostles and he sees the crowd that they're gathering. He sees the work that they're doing, the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit being manifested. And a magician is saying, wow, this is amazing. I want this for myself so that I can be recognized and I can be exalted. So he goes to the, the apostles and says, hey, you know what? Can I buy this from you? I want a little bit of what you've got. Let me write you a check and, and you just give me a little bit of your Holy Spirit power and then I too can receive the adulation that you are receiving and I too can garnish the crowds that you are gathering together. I, I want some of this. And, and Peter, recognizing where this is coming from, he says to Simon, he says, but P Simon, you, you need to repent. Your heart's not right. You're trying to bring that which was intended to bring glory to God and all of these miraculous things that are unfolding to praise him and bring glory to him. And you're trying to divert it and, and put it back on yourself. And Peter says, that's not what this is about. Soli Deo Gloria, it is only for God alone. And by the way, this practice comes into the church later on, not only in the time of Jesus, not only in the time of the apostles, but it's all throughout the history of the church. In fact, this practice called simony that comes from Simon Magus is a practice in church history. And what simony was were different people who were buying church offices. They were buying clerical offices because those were positions of importance and positions of power and positions of influence. And they wanted to be recognized. So they would go and they would give all kinds of money that they would be leaders within the church. It would be like me coming to Union Church of Manila and going to the council and saying, hey, you know what? I... I got 50 million pesos here if you let me be the pastor. You know, what, what do you guys think? And you'd say, why would you want to do that? Well, there's a lot of influential people here. I, you know, there, there's a lot of wealthy people. If I, if I get in a Union Church of Manila, I have all these opportunities open up for me where I can make a name for myself. That was happening all throughout the history of the church, this practice called simony. But not only is there simony, if you look in the history of the church, there's been so much self-odulation where people have wanted uh, others to bow before them or kiss their hands or uh, 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 exalt them and revere them in very dangerous ways. Competitions on who could build the greater cathedral, who was the greater leader, who had more authority, who had more power scarred the landscape of the church too often. And the reformers, they saw all of this and, and they saw all of this, these vain, glorious pursuits and they say, we need to dismiss this. We need to move away in the heart of humanity that has this desire to bring glory to themselves and remember that everything in the created order is given to bring glory to God and God alone. See, we oftentimes think of the Reformation or we oftentimes think of the solas as only involving doctrinal disputes. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, scripture alone. But the reformers, they also knew that, that there was a, a purity of worship that had been lost. And they were calling them 
the church back to this purity of worship. And, and they took seriously the, the teaching that the basic sin of humanity, listen closely, the basic sin of humanity is its refusal to honor God as God and thank him and give him glory for all that he has given us. Instead of bowing the knee to the creator, we often suppress the knowledge of God and misplace the glory that belongs to God and puts it on something that's lesser. In fact, we see that in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, it, it, Paul says, you know, the people, they saw the glory of God everywhere. It, it's obvious. It's on display. Everywhere you look, you can't help but see the glory of God. And yet the people in Romans chapter 1, the Bible tells us that they exchanged the immortal or, or the, the glory of the immortal God for something lesser. Instead of Giving God alone the glory, they, they, they put glory in other areas and other categories, misplaced his glory on something that was far less deserving. And we still do it today. Some still worship trees. Some worship uh, nature and creation itself. Some worship religious authorities. Some revere other people. Some, the all exaltation comes through human reason and, and science and accomplishment. But listen, beloved, any time that we place or, or substitute something else for the glory of God of the Bible and we put it on something else, and w- when we do that, we attempt to share his glory with some other thing. And, and God says, there's only one thing in this universe that merits glory, and that is me. To God alone will be the glory. In fact, if you look at Isaiah chapter 42, a very well-known text, it says, I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory I give to no other. God says, there is nothing that I share my glory with. I am in a category all by myself. And humanity throughout its history tries to take the glory that belongs to me and put it on themselves or put it on something else or put it on the creation. But it all comes back to me. I alone am worthy of glory. And you say, oh, pastor, that seems awfully arrogant and awfully selfish, doesn't it? That God is not willing to share his glory? See, no, that's not the point at all. The point in all of this is that there is nothing in this universe that can adequately compete with the glory of God because all that we have comes from him and to give glory to something else or someone else is simply intellectually not honest. Think of it this way. How can anything or anyone even think about glory having glory when he is the author of everything that we see? How can he share it in all honesty when he is the author of of it all and and give glory to someone else when he is the one who's created all? It's like this. Every now and then we have people who come over to our house and we have dinner and we'll order food out. You know, we'll have grab, drop something off for us and we'll have, you know, this great spread of delicious food and and we'll sit there and we'll enjoy it together. And then at the end of the meal, somebody will say, oh man, this this was a great meal. I loved it. It's so delicious. And I will say in jest, yeah, it's great, isn't it? I made it all myself just for you. And we all laugh. We all know there is no way that I have the ability to make this food that is so delicious and give it to you. I am not the author of that food. And so everybody sort of laughs and rolls their eyes. When God says, I made it all, when anybody competes with that, what the natural reaction should be is a rolling of our eyes going, yeah, right. Because God is the author and the creator and the maker of it all. So If we are being intellectually honest, it all comes back to him. And anybody else who competes with that, it doesn't add up. It's not true. We know that it's not true. 
And not only in, in the fact that he made it all, but think about what we create versus he, what he creates. There is absolutely no comparison between the two, between the works of his hand and the works of my hand. So uh, imagine it this way. Let me illustrate it another way. Suppose I am on the tennis court with Roger Federer. Okay, I'm not that great of a tennis player. Now, if I am playing tennis with Roger Federer, I, I guarantee I'm not going to be able to get even one point off of Roger Federer's serve. I'm not going to be able to get anything back. I I just guarantee it. So Roger Federer spends, you know, 30 minutes serving the ball, ace, 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 ace. And and at the end of the match, it is love, love. You know, I've got nothing. Roger Federer has got six love, six love, and I've got no points on the board. And then somebody comes to me afterwards and says, you know what? You're such a great tennis player. You know, I would think they were being sarcastic, wouldn't you? Even sardonic at that point, saying, you're mocking me, right? Because there is no comparison between what he can do and what I can do. And so when God is saying, the glory belongs to me alone, he is being intellectually honest. He is being truthful. And anything outside of that truth, we would just have to roll our eyes and say, that is ridiculous. Now, There are two categories, though, in the Bible in which it talks about this uniqueness of his his glory to remind us that nothing can indeed compete with that glory. And the first category is his glory in creation. As we look in the created order and just look around and look at nature itself and look at what he has made, it reminds us that to him alone belongs the glory. In fact, that's what it says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Now notice it says for, when you see that for, circle it. Why are you alone worthy to receive glory, honor, and power? And, and why do you get that and no one else? can have that glory, honor, and power. For, explains it to us, notice, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. See, because he created everything, and by his will he can, out of his creative imagination, make everything that, is, that, that we see on this planet and that he sustains it, it is in that alone that he is, as the author of all things, the one who merits all glory. In fact, n- notice how Psalm 19 puts it. Verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. All you have to do is look up into the sky, and as you do that, you should be reminded of his glory. Similarly, Psalm 8 puts it this way. It says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, and you have set your glory in the heavens, right? Meaning this, as all we have to do is, is, is look there, and, and as you look into the heavens, there it is. It's setting for all to display. It's seated right there, and you can't miss it. His glory is all around. See, the idea is when we come out into nature, or even as as we look at one another, as we look at anything that there is to look on on this planet, we have to be able to say, God did that. (laughs) God made that. And you say, well, come on, Chad. You know, I I live in Makati. There's giant buildings all around. Are you saying God did that? I'm saying God did that. I am saying he has given humanity the intellectual creativity and the ability to to take a few bolts and take some steel and take some cement and concrete and and get an uh, architect to to put these plans to make these giant buildings where thousands of people can live in them. I don't see uh, any other animal that is doing that, but God gives us the intellectual ability to create these things. Without his creativity being poured into us, we we could never build these things. So everywhere that you look, you should be able to say the glory of God is on display everywhere in this created order. Even humanity 
itself. You know, the Bible says it this way. It says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7, he says, everyone who was called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I formed, even whom I have made. Do you realize why you were created? You were created not that you would be your own person, not that you would make a name for yourself, not that you would be a prominent face on Google. You were created and formed and put together for his glory, to display his great creativity, his power, his ability, just the magnificence of, uh, of what he is able to do that no one else is able to do. You were created for soli deo gloria. And when you stand in front of the mirror, you know, after this sermon's over, go, go and look in the mirror and, and look at, just look at yourself in that mirror and say soli deo gloria. This was created for him and him alone and his glory, nothing more. For his glory. I am created to display the glory of God. You know, all throughout history, though, we have tried to make a name for ourselves and misplace the glory that goes to God and bring it back to ourselves in the things that we say, and the things that we do, and the things that we create. All you have to do is go to Genesis chapter 11, and we have what's called the Tower of Babel. You know, the people there, they all gather together. And the Bible says in verse 4, it says, they come together and they say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And notice, and and, and let us, as we do that, as we're building this, this great tower, let us make a name for ourselves. We want our name on Google. (laughs) We want, you know, when we type in Babel, you know, there's our tower. And we can look to ourselves and go, we did that. That, That's us. That's all about us. We want a name for ourselves. And so they build this tower. And, and, you know, and I got to thinking, you know, they build this tower. It's, you know, how old? We're, We're talking about several thousand years ago. How impressive was this tower? I'm sure the tower wasn't impressive at all as they're building it. And as they're building and making their tower, did it ever occur to them as they're looking at their tiny little tower and making a name for themselves to think, this tower is not that impressive at all. Look at what God has made out of his hand. And we have this little tower. And we we think we can make a name for ourselves out of building this little mound in the middle of Babel. (laughs) No, no. compared to the glory of God, this this is nothing at all. This is an insignificant thing. Have you ever, have you heard about elephant art? I, 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 I came across it this week. You know, there's places in different parts of the world, especially here in Asia, you get a bunch of people in a, uh, in a theater, amphitheater, and they bring out an elephant, and they give him a paintbrush. And that paintbrush with the elephant, they teach him how to make one particular drawing. So he, he can make like a little basic, you, you know, crude picture of an elephant. You know, they, they, they refresh the brush, and he makes these little lines, and sometimes he just makes random marks on the page. And if you ever watch those on YouTube, this elephant is making these marks. And, you know, it's the equivalent of a four-year-old drawing, right? And the people that are watching are going, ooh, wow, this is amazing. And it is. I mean, there's an elephant and he's drawing. He's drawing the one picture he has been trained to draw, okay? It's kind of neat, right? Now, put his art next to Rembrandt. Put them side by side. I've got a picture of them side by side. Elephant art, Rembrandt. All the complexities of Rembrandt's paintings, the nuances, the shades, the tones. And if you were to put them next to each other and not say one is an elephant and one is a human, you would put them next to each other and you would go, what is this one doing? This is not even in the same category. And you're right. It is impressive for an elephant. But for a human, it's not impressive at all. 
And, and, and I think that's what we do is we re- think that the things that we are making are so impressive, but next to the splendor of what God creates and the created order and the intricacies and the nuances of the planet and the nuances of humanity itself and the nuances of this universe and, and the, from the smallest to the grandest things and God puts it all together and makes this marvelous portrait And we build a tower and go, ooh, (laughs) it's elephant art. It's not that really spectacular next to the glory of God. In fact, God says it this way in Isaiah chapter 55. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He says, my painting is better than your painting. My works of my hands are are higher than your works of your hands. My abilities are far more profound. My creativity is more imaginative than your creativity. And and my ingenuity is loftier than the things that you can come up with. I am altogether in a category of being glorious, incomparable to anyone else. See, the point that's being established in Scripture is that when we look at the complexity and the very vastness of what God created and we let that settle into our minds and we let that flow over what we think about, we cannot help but come to the realization, indeed, you are in a different category than the 8 billion people on this earth and you alone are worthy of glory. To God alone be the glory. Nothing can compare what he manufactures and generates out of his mind and his creative force. You know, I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I'm sure you, you heard the news. We put a helicopter on Mars. Anybody see that? I, I was fascinated by this. I, I just couldn't stop reading about the helicopter we put on Mars. We sent that out in 2020, and in the middle of April, this helicopter, it arrives on Mars, and it is the first item that has taken flight on another planet than Earth that we have created, right? That's a controlled flight. And so they lift this helicopter up, and it goes back and forth for a little bit, and then they set it back down. And I was marveling. I couldn't stop watching this. I I, I just read all about it and and was so excited to think that we can take something that's 55 million kilometers away and put it on another planet and fly it around and set it down, take pictures and and do all kinds of neat things with this little helicopter on, on something that's 55 million kilometers away. Blew my mind. And so I'm looking at all these pictures and I'm, and then all of a sudden my mind goes to the pictures that it's, that are being taken of this, not at the helicopter. By the way, the name of the helicopter is called Ingenuity. You you know what Ingenuity means? It basically means clever or original or inventive. It's the same etymology where we get ingenious. And we think, yeah, it's ingenious that we can take this and put it 55 million uh, kilometers away and fly it around on another planet. That's ingenious. That's Ingenuity at its finest. But then as I'm looking at Ingenuity, I'm looking at the landscape behind it. I'm looking at the, 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 the views and the mountains and, and the atmosphere of another planet. I'm thinking about the climate and the gravitational pull that requires a helicopter. And then I'm thinking that this is 55 million kilometers away and that there's millions of these planets all scattered throughout our galaxy and that there's millions of the stars that these planets go around and and they're hundreds of thousands of light years away. And all of a sudden, our ingenuity doesn't look too ingenious anymore, does it? We flew around a little helicopter on another planet for about three minutes compared to the vastness of what God creates. To God alone be the glory. Brian O'Connor, a retired astronomer, uh, astronaut, he said, you know, enhanced faith is pretty common for astronauts. I can tell you I felt a sense of awe out there looking at the earth that I never had before. 
when you step out into the stars and you think about the vastness of what God has created, all of a sudden you realize you're in a different category. He's in a different category. And to him alone be, it belongs the glory. And even in one more category, when we start thinking about not, not only the vastness of, of the universe itself, but how about the complexity of the human body? Let me, let me just give you one other illustration that I was reading about this, this week. It is that of the retina, the human eye. And how complicated the human eye is. John Blanchard, he's a scientist. He said, the human eye is truly an amazing phenomenon. The tiny retina contains about 130 rod-shaped cells, which detect light intensity and transmit impulses to the visual cortex of the brain by means of some 1 million nerve fibers. Well, nearly 6 million cone-shaped cells do the same job, but respond specifically to color variation. The eyes can handle 500,000 messages simultaneously and are kept clear by ducts that are producing just the right amount of fluid, which the, lens, the lids clean both eyes simultaneously in one five thousandth of a second. Okay, so a group of scientists got together and said, what would we need to do to recreate the human eye? What kind of computer would we need? And, and they thought about all the logistics of, uh, of what's required to recreate the human eye. They came up with this. They said, well, the retina weighs less than one gram and occupies 0 0.0003 inches of space and uses 0 0.00001 watts of power. If you were to create a computer to replicate just one retina, According to scientists, it would weigh 45 kilograms, and it is, the seeing chip would require 300 watts of energy, and such a chip would have the equivalent of 1 million transistors, while the retina has the equivalent of 25 billion uh, transistors. Think about that. You need 45 kilometers here, or kilograms here, 45 kil kilograms here, and then you'd need some electrical impulses to be, uh, uh, you know, plugged into. It's like having a little uh, electric car on your head just to carry out what the retinas are doing. You know, just go this week and read a little bit about the human eye. You, 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 when you understand how complex it is, you realize how great indeed God is. And to him alone belongs the glory. By the way, I think, and I can't prove this, there's no biblical foundation. This is just the meandering of, of my own mind. But why did God make the eye so complicated? Because when we stand and we look at each other eye to eye, the first thing that we look at is this complicated thing and go, oh man, only God can do that. To him alone be the glory. When you look someone in the eye, you should be able to say, to God alone be the glory. I put number one on your outline. Jot it down today if you're following along. I need to regularly recall the glory of God in his creation. I need to regularly recall the glory of God. It is good, beloved, to marvel at creation through the lens of the glory of God. It's not just enough to love his beauty or admire his beauty or think of its vastness. It is given. The, glory, the, the creation is given in its vastness that we would whisper in awe or we would shout in praise to God alone be the glory. That is why it is given. So this vast creation, the heavens display the glory of the Lord. And there is a danger, beloved, that when we sort of become numb to all of this, that when we forget about the glory of God in all of the creation, there is a danger that we begin to misplace that glory on something else or someone else. And the Bible says, no, when you look out in the created order, it is there to display the glory of God so that when we see it on its display, we return back and say, no one else can do that. There is only one in all that exists that can do that. And that belongs to God alone. To him belongs all the glory. Remember in Romans chapter 1, they forgot about the glory of God and they put it on other things. And they wound up wandering away from him, losing the perspective of how great he is. 
And they sought and they exchanged that for other things and they began to worship other things. The glory of God is on display everywhere. Are you looking around on a daily basis and saying glory to God? It's there on display for us. But the second element of glory that, that the Bible talks about it's not only in the created order, there's something even more magnificent than the created order, according to the scripture. The Bible reminds us that his glory is displayed in the rescue and the redemption of a people who rejected him, of a people that was broken, of a people that was dying, as a people who was perishing and moving away from God, that in his glory... He sent his son and rescued and redeemed and remade those people and gives them eternal life. In fact, if you look at the story in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying and hears his prayer. He says, when Jesus has spoken these, he lift up his eyes to his heaven and, uh, heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Now glorify your son that the son may glorify you. What, what is he talking about? Glorify the son that the, glor- the, the son may glorify you. He is about ready to go to the cross. And he's saying, as I am on that cross, this is the most glorious thing. My mission is being accomplished. Your mission is being accomplished to rescue and redeem the fallenness of humanity, to restore them to you. And so, Lord, while I'm there, may, may your glory be in me and may, may I glorify you. This is where your glory is. I am on the cross. The, the glory of God is on full display for all humanity because it speaks of God's rescue of all humanity. And he goes on in verse 4. He says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. I, I did that what you wanted me to do. And what was the purpose of it? that you would be glorified. My mission to rescue humanity is to bring glory to God. You see, the greatest glory given to God is that Jesus came. And the ones who rejected his glory, the ones who marred the glory of God's creation, God says, I'm going to correct that. I'm going to take that and I'm going to restore that. And you all will see just how glorious I am, that that which is broken and that which is re- res- uh, that, that, that has been uh, wandered from me, I'm going to use my glory and I'm going to bring them back. What a glorious display of his authority. In fact, you know what the Bible says uh, about this in, in 1 Peter? You know, of all the things that he's done, you know, think of this, your redemption, your salvation, your forgiveness of sins, the foul is made righteous, the blemish spotless, the condemned adopted. And according to first Peter, Peter's writing to the churches of Asia Minor, and he's talking about the salvation. In the first chapter, he talks about the amazing salvation and all the nuances of the wonderful salvation that is given to us as believers. But at the end of this discussion on our amazing salvation, his final words are this. He says, concerning the salvation, he says, these are the things which angels long to look. Now now think about that. Angels have seen quite a few things, haven't they? I mean, have they not seen the fullness of the glory of God in display in so many different ways? I mean, in Job, it says in Job chapter 38, it says that the angel shouted for joy and sang at the dawning of creation. Now, wouldn't you have liked to have been that? Wouldn't that be a glorious thing to see God, boom, and there it is. It's all created, and the angels get to see that. The angels visited Abraham and announced the miraculous birth of his son. Angels were descending and ascending on Jacob's ladder. Angels were at the present uh, present at the giving of the Mosaic law. They ministered to Elijah, the prophet. They were sent to bind the the mouths of the lions and the lion's den. They announced the the birth of Jesus. They they ministered to Jesus after his temptation. They were there at Jesus' resurrection. They rescued Peter miraculously from prison. And then you go to the book of Revelation. I mean, there's angels seeing all kinds of amazing things. It's like an angel convention at the end of the Bible. All these amazing things that they are seeing. And yet Peter says, you know what? Of all those things, the angels, what really captivates them, what really excites them, 
where they really see the glory of God on display is in your salvation. That they take that which is lost and that which is broken and that which is marred and he restores it and makes it holy and he adopts and gives eternal life. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter one. Look at this very closely with me. If you have a Bible, turn to this passage because I think this is an important passage when it comes to understanding the glory of God in our salvation. He says, in him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. You were predestined and you were hoped and you, were, uh, you have hope. Uh, you placed your hope in Christ and in that you have your salvation. And, and why is that? It says that that example of you having salvation is to the praise of his glory. It's for the glory of God that you have salvation is for the glory of God. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 13. It says, in him, you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Think of this. He saved you and then he sealed you with the Holy Spirit to guarantee that you have eternal life, that you have the inheritance that God has promised, that nothing can take that away from you. Beloved, who else could do these things? And and that's why the scripture, Paul says, all of this, your salvation is all for his glory. It is not for the the purpose of just saving me. (laughs) Although that's part of it. He, He loved us so much that he wanted to save us. But even in saving humanity and even in the salvation, it was given so that he would be glorified, that this act would bring glory to his name. Beloved, when we bring and lead people to Christ and point people to the message of Christ and and they come to the knowledge and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We get excited for them, right? There's a new name written down in the book. There's somebody who now has eternal life. But beloved, don't forget that in that moment, there is something miraculous that happens as well. That God takes that which is dead and brings it back alive. He takes that which is blemished and makes it holy. He does something that no one else can do. It is all for his glory. And not only do we rejoice in the fact that these people have newfound salvation, we then turn to the Lord and say, you are glorious that you can breathe life into this death that you can breathe redemption into this brokenness. Soli Deo Gloria. So no one else can do what God does, not even close. Who do you know that can seal you for redemption? Who do you know that can put the Holy Spirit in you to reside within you? Who do you know that can forgive you for of your sins? Who do you know that can make you blemish or, or without blemish, that can make you spotless? Who do you know that can uh, give you a guarantee of eternal inheritance? The church can't do that. A a, a pastor can't do that. A priest can't do that. A a rabbi can't do that. An imam can't do that. A, a, A scholar can't do that. There is only one. And it's outside of this human race. There is only one who can rescue all of humanity. And that is the Lord himself. To him alone be the glory. He's in an altogether different category. I put number two on your outline. If you're following along, jot this down. I need to remember the glory of God in the work of our salvation. I need to be reminded of the work of God and the glory of God in our salvation. You know, there's that old song we used to sing as I was growing up in our church. It said, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gates that all may come in. And then the chorus says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. To God, uh, oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. 
and give him the glory, great things he has done. The work of Christ, that he would come and give an atonement for sin, that he would cover us and he would rescue us. That all goes back to the glory of God. Have you given him glory for this work in your life? Do you praise him and exalt him and say, you alone can be my rescue? We need this principle in all things, in creation, in salvation, in the way that the Bible speaks about the glory of God. Beloved, we need this back in our sort of our viewfinder again. How easy it is in the sort of day in and day out drudge of life as we're surrounded by so many other things to set aside the glory of God. I would imagine that some of us have gone weeks, months, years without fully just pausing and reflecting on his glory and creation and his glory in our salvation. Beloved, we need to turn back to soli deo gloria. This is what the reformers are saying. It underpins everything else. If we have that heart that is cultivated for his glory, that shapes everything that we do. It shapes who we are. That we realize that we are existed, we are existing and we are living and we are moving and we are breathing, and what we are trying to accomplish in this world is for the glory of God. Do, do you have that sort of mental framework in the way that you live your life? Have you been considering his glory? Are you trying to build your own towers? You know, back to my daughter and her internet discovery. You know, our youth director did something similar. Did a similar search on my arrival. You know, he looked up Chad Williams on the internet. And uh, he found a very famous American football player. And so he decided he would run, you know, as a loving and kind gift to me and a welcome for for me coming to Union Church of Manila. He decided he would run hundreds of copies of pages of this picture of Chad Williams. I still have them in my office, some of them, because every now and then I'll open a book and they have stuffed these, I mean, hundreds of them all over the place. They're in shelves, they're in drawers, they're in books, they're on rafters. I see one up in my rafter. I can't get to it. I don't know even how they got it up there, but it's up there and I see it hanging off. Chad Williams at, with a note, welcome to UCM, Chad Williams. <laughs> and as I, I look at this, you, you know, I was thinking, I, I guess my face didn't come up. <laughs> so, you, you know, they must have lovingly decided they would put um, uh, Chad Williams there. And then I began to think, you know, this face or this name, Chad Williams, I guess it's not all that important after all. It's not that big. I mean, if you really, if you look up Chad Williams on the internet, you'll see a lot more people that are a lot more important than I am who have done a lot greater things than I have done. But then I got to thinking, you know, that face of Chad Williams, this face of Chad Williams, whatever face of Chad Williams, whatever accomplishment of Chad Williams or any other name, It's just one face and a face of 8 billion people on this planet. It's really not that impressive when you put it that way. And when we think that there is only one God who created those 8 billion people, and there is only one God who sustains those 8 billion people, and there's only one God who made the complex earth that they live on and the unfathomable universe that they are in, And that there is only one God who can save them all. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Lord, may you receive the glory. May you receive the honor. May you receive the praise. May our hearts return to a position unlike that of Romans that exchanges the glory of God for something else or places it on something lower. May our heart always cry in its depth and may it course through our minds 
that you alone receive the glory in your name. Amen. receive our closing doxology together. Now, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
God bless and have a great week.